I'll just let you introduce yourself. Actually, I'm seriously considering changing my job title to dog running around bears. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I will be even happier if you're totally bored by the first half of my presentation. And that's why I brought this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, actually, I, I'll come to that. Um, the, I will talk about very basic things, and I'm referring to a presentation of the exact same title from last year. Uh, it's not necessary that you know about that presentation. I will give you uh, the basics uh, to know what I'm talking about. Um, the title is Born Compressed, Should the Preservation Community Embrace Lossy uh, Video Compression? Uh, the speaker a year ago pointed out that um, from uh, the, the point of view of the user of the archive, uh, it makes no sense to inflate digital born uh, compressed files to uncompressed or losslessly compressed files. And those files uh, are very cumbersome to handle for researchers who are only interested in the image content. And the comparison was like the archive or the, the collector of files as a collector of uh, beach balls. And he, he is uh, actually uh, storing them in an inflated way instead of a deflated way and complaining he has not enough storage space. Um, and uh, in answering to this, um, I will talk first in the first half talk about technical characteristics and uh, the access hierarchy of archival files. So I will kind of give an extended answer to uh, these two statements. And then um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about what I kind of expected last year's talk to be about. And I would suggest if you are kind of um, unhappy with my talk, you can next year organize a talk again with the same title uh, <laughs> to get into that uh, subject correctly. So uh, technical characteristics uh, when, when producing uh, files within the uh, archival context, we usually have um, three uh, categories of, of um, files and objects, let's say it like that. Um, these are two. Uh, the archival storage is kind of the core, uh, where um, the digital archival files are produced and stored. And at the same time, there will be um, f files produced for presentation and for viewing, for access. Um, Naturally, there's also the source. This can be, in the case of digital bond, this will be digital files or the tapes or film, whatever. If you're into OAIS, um, here's the terms. Um, actually, uh, Martin Wrigley uh, pointed out more or less in, in yesterday's talk uh, a few of the steps where you how you how to go from the source into the AIP and uh, looking at the source this is basically what what you get it can be analog or digital it can be any format any data format and uh, you shouldn't dispose of it and this um, comes with metadata, again referring to an earlier speaker, uh, Lars uh, Gaustart, talked of the full payload. So the idea is to um, get into a digital, into the digital domain when digitizing uh, the full amount of information. And this is not only uh, the image or the sound or both, uh, but also concerns a lot of meta information. Also, the previous speaker has been talking about that. So with the, with the, the, the physical element of, uh, of, the, of the source, um, there comes a lot of meta information, which needs to be also uh, put into the digital domain to, to create the, con the correct context. 
Uh, in the archival digital storage, we have, uh, uh, first, the uh, storage needs to be um, long-term digital storage. It has certain characteristics. Um, you store their archival file formats, which, um, which correspond to a certain set of, uh, of uh, characteristics. And um, the archivals, the, the, element, the digital element you store in the archive is a digital representation of your source element. And the meta information is naturally part of that digital representation. So uh, looking at born digital files, th those files are converted into an archival file format which complies with the requirements for archival file formats. And uh, this is to improve its longevity. And equal to any tape or other analog uh, source element, the digital born file should be kept as well and as received. There's not really a reason why to change this strategy for digital born elements compared to uh, analog born or whatever born elements. And um, another speaker today, uh, Merle Fried Friedrichsen, uh, already talked about this. So the, the, the condition for a file format to be an archival fi file format, um, it, it needs to comply with a, a list of, of uh, properties. Um, I'm not going further into that, but if you, if you uh, look at these properties, on one hand, if you, if you see them as cast in concrete, uh, then the only solution will be that uh, you should keep storing your beach balls in inflated um, condition. On the other hand, uh, these same conditions have also a certain level of, let's say, flexibility to it or point, uh, can change according to your personal or your archive's point of view. And I'm getting back to this later on when we're talking about uh, archiving of uh, actually uh, lossy compressed files. Uh, for the presentation element, it's a high quality master element. It can have any suitable format. Um, it's the visual representation of the source element. And in there lies something compared to the digital representation. It's like something between uh, the photo negative and the, the print you strike of it. The print has usually a, a, a worse resolution. There's less image information in there compared to the negative, but it has the information on how that thing looked and how people perceived it. So in both elements, there's information which are not in the other. And therefore, this, this information about the visual representation also belongs into the um, archival information package. Um, so uh, the last element is the viewing element. It is of low quality. It has any suitable file format. Uh, f for the way you, you want to use it, or uh, that's the point where the user of the archive comes in, and it has a li limited visual, is a, sorry, it is a limited visual representation of the source element, and these limitations should, in the general case, be um, um, made up with the metadata which helps you to correctly interpret what you see and hear there. So looking at an access hierarchy, we kind of uh, put those elements in a different, uh, in a, in a different uh, structure to each other. We have different layers within um, this hierarchy of access to those different files. And um, at first, um, there is kind of there's kind of a physical difference between the area you keep the analog 
or tape formats uh, compared to where you keep the digital files. You don't want your vinegar films to uh, lie, lie next to your um, um, digital archive so it will breathe in all the, all the acetic acid. This is kind of obvious but it needs to be said. And the only exception there are the digital born files, which will also go uh, and lie within the digital archival storage. At the same time, you will need your geographically separated second storage site. Now, on top of all of this is the search engine, which gives you access, which gives you uh, information on, the, on what is in your archive. And on all of these levels, there's this, this metadata, which should correspond naturally, which should not be different. Uh, but not on every layer, there will be the same amount of metadata. Um, naturally, the set of meta information should be complete for the digital archival storage, but they may, there may only be an excerpt of it within uh, accessible through the search engine. Um, but there shouldn't be more in the search engine than in your archival storage. And uh, in the source, uh, in the analogs and tape um, storage, there will be also meta information, uh, but which should be represented in the digital uh, archival storage. And um, yeah, as you all know, there's this separation uh, for security reasons also needs to exist between the two um, or even three elements, as we have heard earlier, um, of this archival storage. Now for access, um, ideally access to uh, the search engine will be easy. It, it can be limited within the institution, but ideally it may be uh, even an online access so people can actually search elements within your institution. And then the access to viewing and presentation elements is more limited to a smaller group of people. Um, this is in a way a matter of your organization on how limited this access is. But, um, and this is kind of uh, important in this respect. Um, we have a differentiation between a digital storage space and a digital archival storage space. So um, your, your presentation and viewing elements as well as your search engine will definitely not be on the same, um, on the, let's say, on the same carrier hot, hot drive as your, your archive, digital archival storage for security reasons. So there must be a, let's get this back. Um, there must be a, at least a firewall, even if it's to a certain degree in the same physical space, there needs to be a firewall to make access to your archival storage um, uh, much more restricted than uh, to your other files. And then uh, once you have actually a digital representation of all your uh, source uh, analog and tape source elements, there will be actually no reason anymore or very unlikely to be a reason to ever get back to those if you have really brought all the image and metadata information into your digital uh, archival storage. So, um, Looking at our two statements, we can already say we've already answered so far the question about why does an archive make uh, the blown up or the, the inflated files, but there is still this statement of the files are very cumbersome to handle for researchers who are only interested in the image content. Sure, they are, but um, you should never, as a user of the archive, ever get access to them. What the archive delivers to the user is, in the first instance, uh, the viewing elements and not the digital archival elements. Because if you go and take them out of your digital archive, every time somebody asks for such a file, that's already a level of 
insecurity which is unacceptable. So um, if, if you as a user of an archive will get the actual archival digital format, then your archive has a needs to fix the access hierarchy. There's a problem in there. It's not the user's problem. It's actually the problem of the archive. Uh, with, within this whole context, there are some other uh, topics that would need clarification. I don't have time to get into that, but uh, one thing is that uh, nowadays the, there's usually not just one archival master, digital archival master element. So you have usually what one calls a raw scan, you have a graded master, restored master. We've also seen that in the context of uh, the art video, so um, this, this bunch of um, high-res, large archival files gets uh, growing and growing, also meaning um, that we need more and more uh, storage space for these. And uh, what, I, what I've seen within the context of external service providers is that, especially for smaller archives with, less, with let's say, mixed um, uh, collections, uh, the service provider will just throw all the elements they are producing, and these are basically what I've been mentioning, they all throw it onto an LTO and deliver it to the archive, and the archive will uh, put this LTO or several LTOs in there into their um, digital archival premises. Um, and sometimes they don't even have access to it. So they don't have the means to spread these different elements which are not all part of the digital archival uh, package. Uh, they, they don't put them to their respective place. So there is something which needs to be clarified within these workflows, um, which are still unclear. It's also unclear if you have a change within the meta information, how are they gonna um, uh, update the meta information on an LTO which they don't really have access, are they going to send it to the provider and spend a lot of money just for updating a little bit of meta information? So this, this concerns more very small archives which, where, where audiovisual files are not the main, um, their, their, their main collection. Now, uh, Changing over to um, the, uh, the actual subject of lossy compression in archival masters. Um, I'm basing what I'm saying on uh, Memoriov's recommendations. Um, they, they are worked out by Agathe Jarczyk, Greto Kromo, Yves Niederhäuser and me. And um, we with, within uh, this, this document, we are naturally also talking about these conditions for archival elements. And by the way, you can download this, uh, this document for free on, on Memoriov's um, website. So within this document, we, we, we are talking about the suitability of certain uh, elements uh, for, for the digital archive. Or, the, or as digital archival elements, and we kind of had to um, um, start not being totally binary, saying not suited or suited, so we introduced this, this uh, conditionally recommended formats due to the fact that many archives are just already, especially broadcast archives, are actually storing compressed uh, file formats as archival formats. One, one example, Swiss Television storing XDCAM HD. Another example, a Swiss NGO organization using ProRes. So it's a fact, and because it's a fact, we'll have to talk about it. Um, I'm, but I'm giving you an example uh, of an art collecting institution in Switzerland. They have a mixed collection, but they also have about 145 audiovisual artworks. 135 are SD video, carrier-based, umatic, etc. Um, 10 are digital born in HD video, 
uh, digital bone in lossy compression. And um, they also have an in-house production of documentation in HD video, so they will record talks, interviews, they may make a documentation of especially complex uh, artwork, etc., on video in-house. So they are producing footage, which is connected to certain artworks. Um, I don't have numbers, but I'm assuming that this in-house production for documentation will produce one hour of HD video for, let's say, 30% of the artworks. And if you're now going into the amount of um, uh, digital data this produces, if you look to the left, um, we have the artworks. We have 135 artworks um, in SD, which will give about 100 terabyte uncompressed. And we have the 10 uh, artworks produced in HD, which already go far beyond uh, if stored in um, uncompressed HD. Uh, the, the pinkish area is just kind of uh, interesting. Um, the largest individual art piece, uh, the amount of data of the largest individual art piece is in pink. So. Uh, looking at the uh, at, uh, digital born uh, site, uh, the, one of these art pieces is a 24 hour art piece on DVD, and if you, on, no, on, on Blu ray, and if you expand this HD um, to uh, uncompressed, you will receive uh, an amount which uh, goes far beyond all the other. Uh, pieces. So um, it indicated as DOC is the amount of data produced in HD to the left uncompressed to the right in XD Cam HD. So this is the source, uh, the, the source file format, and if stored in XD Cam HD, you don't lose any quality, and it is not a, a priority. Um, element, the priority is the artworks, but you will spend most of your um, investments in time and money preserving your own documentation material. So uh, to conclude and to basically put this question out to you instead of answering it, because we've seen in the last uh, presentation that the questions are now asked from here. Um, the, the total amount of data uncompressed uh, can be reduced significantly as everything goes to FFV1. Still, this imbalance between the SD and the HD um, elements will remain. And um, then if you, if the, the third column from left shows you uh, the amount of data if you store everything but the documentation uncompressed and the documentation in XDCAM HD, and the smallest column is if everything goes to uh, FFV1 and, and the, the documentation HD video remains in XDCAM HD. So this is kind of a statement. I want to know what you think of that. It, does it make sense to stay with XDCAM HD? Does it not make sense? Um, there, there are the, the regular drawbacks to uh, using XDCAM HD for, um, for archiving, the chances that th that data is lost is higher for the documentation footage. More efforts need to be invested in regular checks for obsolete formats. And you may have to transcode in the future, uh, either inflating them or if you go transcode to another lossy format, you may lose additional image quality. So, uh, yeah, let's have the conclusion together. We're slightly over time, uh, but we have to break next. So, if who wants a break? No. <laughs> I know Peter has something to say. 
I actually would have a question for like, where do you make the difference for the use case of presentation and the viewing format? I didn't see that clear, both. Viewing and presentation yeah. format. The presentation format will be cinema quality. The viewing format will okay. be web, yeah, web okay. streaming. I, I so because yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. No for presentation SD for me this would not is be necessary. Big. Huh? For SD material, that would probably not be necessary. No. Okay. no. Well, if you have an online tool, you will need to convert everything to a funny online format, and sure. you can't show uncompressed or, or, or let's say, uh, you will not show it in in a in a ProRes quality as well. Sure. Um, about the XDCAM HD, I mean, my personal thing would be. Um, try to, if you can decompress the files right now with, for example, FFmpeg, go archive a git clone of FFmpeg along with the XCAM HD files, and you're pretty safe for quite a while. Because whenever you run into the issue of those files not being able to render with the tools around at that time, you can use the archived copy of FFmpeg to get out of this format at the late point in time. Yeah, which basically applies to almost all lossy formats, excluded patent situations. Because mm. I mean, once once Kieran K has uh, reverse engineered all lossy formats, then we're in a different situation. But that will need a few Christmas <laughs> until we're there, no? Okay, we have one last question. Uh, one last uh, one question. Uh, I saw that you would recommend to transcode ProRes to something like FFV1 or, or another archive format. How would you check that the archive copy that you made is identical content-wise to your ProRes file? Well, you, ca you can't. Okay, if, you, if we agree that you cannot easily, then why is it a good idea to make this copy? To, archive, to use an archive copy of which you don't know if it contains this, the exact content of what you had as original? Well, my level of trust that it actually does is higher than my level of trust that ProRes will exist for okay, a long thank time. Thank you for the answer. Sorry? Thank you for your answer. Yeah.